You are listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books with anyone and everyone. While listening to my podcast, you will hear author interviews, behind-the-scenes conversations about various aspects of the publishing world, theme discussions with other book lovers, and more. For more book recommendations and a complete list of all of my interviews, check out my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts From a Page. In 2022, I would love for you to join my Patreon group. I offer at least two bonus episodes a month and a monthly advanced read and pre-publication author chat. For those on Facebook, I host a special Patreon Facebook group where we all chat books. Thanks so much to those who already participate, and I hope you will consider joining us. Today, I am chatting with Erica Forensic about Girl in Ice. Erica is the award-winning author of the acclaimed thrillers The River at Night, Into the Jungle, and Girl in Ice, which the New York Times Book Review declared hauntingly beautiful. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Erica. How are you today? I'm good. How are you, Cindy? I am also good, and I'm so excited to talk with you about Girl in Ice. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. It's been quite a journey. I bet it has. I know you're at the tail end of the first round of your book tour, and that has to be exciting. It is exciting and kind of a relief. <laughs> to be back home in your own house. Be back home. I'm, do- I'm doing plenty of stuff, but I get to do it within a 30-mile radius, which is nice. Absolutely. Well, before we dive into my questions, why don't you just give me a quick synopsis of Girl and Ice for those that won't have read it yet? Sure. So Girl and Ice is about an American linguist who is tasked to go to a very remote climate research center off the coast of Greenland, where a girl, a very young girl, has been found in a glacier. She has thawed out alive, and she's speaking a language no one understands. Now, eight months before the novel, Val's twin brother, Andy, who was a climate research center at this very outpost, walked out middle of the night, Arctic night, 50 degrees below zero, freezes to death. Now, Val doesn't really know if he took his life or actually just what happened. But the story begins when Val gets an email from Wyatt. Wyatt was one of the only other people up there when Andy walked out in the middle of the night. And the email tells Val about the girl, that he's found the girl, and he's basically begging Val to come up and try to understand what she's saying, because Val is a specialist in dead Nordic languages. Now, Val has her own problems. She's got her own pretty severe anxiety disorder. She's only comfortable in a few places, her home, her work. So to be even asked to do something like this is feels impossible to her. But in the email is a little clip of the girl's speech. and. She, she clicks it, but she cannot understand what the girl is saying. But she hears fear. She hears trauma. She hears a cry for help, basically. So that is really what drives her to overcome her fears and, and take that step and go to Greenland and try to figure out not only what the girl is saying, but what happened to her brother. Yeah, that's what it's about. And where the girl came from. I mean, I know they found her in the ice, but like her source. Yeah. Yeah. Why was she there? Yes, exactly. And who is she, right? Who is she? 
Well, what an interesting idea. How in the world did you come <laughs> up with the idea of a girl frozen in the ice and then speaking a language that no one knows? Well, I I loved writing this book so much because I, I feel like I was following, I, and I tell my students to do this. I tell them to follow their fascinations. I was listening, actually I listened to a, a talk by Werner Herzog, who's a famous filmmaker, and they asked him, how do you how do you make these wild films? And he just says, he just follows his fascinations. Anyway, that's the term I've borrowed. But for me, the fascinations in this book are an Arctic environment. I love writing also on the edge between what is real and what isn't. Not so much science fiction, but something that can feel close to that it might be possible. I love Arctic settings. I don't have a real explanation for why. There is a film there are a lot of iterations of the Frankenstein movie, but in one of the Frankenstein movies, it's a black and white movie, and Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster is, it's at the end of his journey, he's bloody, he's hunted, and he's sick of humanity, and he's turning into this blizzard, uh, you know, I think it's Mont Blanc, and he's this big blocky silhouette disappearing into this blizzard, and there's so much, that that scene has haunted me, and just it just has broken my heart and i've just tried to figure out how to grab that feeling there's something so moving to me about that but the actual spark for the book came i in the winter of 20, 2017 i was walking behind my house and i live in the northeast and um, it was winter i came to a pond we have a pond behind here and i saw these three little tiny turtles little juvenile painted turtles and they were they were frozen mid stroke and I thought, well, they don't look alive, but they don't look quite dead either. So, you know, I ran home, I Googled it all. Turns out there are creatures that can actually freeze, not just go into a torpor, actually freeze and come back alive. You know, certain alligators actually, uh, wood frogs, there's even a microscopic creature called a tardigrade or water bear that can be frozen hundreds of degrees below zero and be thawed out 10 years and be just fine. But these creatures possess a certain cryoprotein that we do not possess. And this cryoprotein protects the cells from freezing because when you think about it, think about an ice cube and how jagged it is and how how it might break through a cell. So ironically, we can freeze an embryo. That's only 120 cells. But obviously, we can't freeze people. But anyway, I ran home with this image of a girl frozen in a glacier and I just saw her foot you know I just saw her the side of her foot and I thought she's running what is she running from who is she and then I you know worked back from there as to the story and I wasn't able to stop you know so that's that's always a good feeling you know absolutely and that is totally fascinating oh, but on top you. of it then to be speaking a language that no one understands like where did that component come from to me that was the part that was so intriguing Oh, okay. Well, I guess I just didn't, I didn't want the answer to be that she was just a local person that, that that had happened to. I mean, again, if you're, if you're thinking of it that way, you still have to buy the, you know, speculative component that she's thought out alive, right? The third mystery is what language is she speaking? Why does Val, who you know, speaks uh, the language of the Vikings or understands it, does not understand a word or even a morpheme or unit of meaning of what she's saying. And I I feel like I could talk about what, why I did that, but I I feel like I'm bordering on spoiler territory. No, that's true. Okay. (laughs) I just thought it was interesting. So, and and, you know, and I'm the first one to to do the spoilers, you know, so I have to like, I, I've been, I've been learning to, you know, stop while I'm ahead. (laughs) Wait a minute. That's a spoiler. That's a spoiler. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about your research then, because you took a fabulous trip, right? That kind of inspired some of this, or at least helped inform your writing? Um, Actually, it was more the latter. So I I never go anywhere without... Well, first of all, for me, I have to have an idea first. It starts with an idea. And and it can't just be any idea, because as we know as writers, it has to be an idea that we're madly in love with, because we have to live with it for years, right? four years or something, the writing process, the editing process, the publishing process. So first comes the idea for me. Then I spend three or four months writing an outline, very detailed outline, 
That's the way I work because I've written too many books without a detailed outline that have fallen apart in my 37 years of writing. And I'll never do that again, you know. So I spent three or four months doing that. Then I write a first draft and then I plan the trip because. I need to know what I'm looking for when I go to Greenland or, you know, for into the jungle, I went to the Peruvian Amazon. What am I looking for? Who do I need to interview? What what do I need to ask them? At the same time, you're right. I mean, I also have to and want to and enjoy keeping myself open to whatever I see, feel, hear, taste, smell, you know, so that I can bring it on home to the, the book and the reader. But the story comes first. The human story comes first. That is, I mean, the setting can be fabulous and it can be a character unto itself, as we know, but it's the human story that needs to, you know, ground everything and is what keeps you flipping the pages, right? You know what I mean? So I think that's right. But I do think that the setting, if it's not right or it's not developed well enough, that it will pull you outside the book. So I kind of feel like sometimes they're both equally important. Yeah, you're right. Because sometimes if it's not clear, you sort of feel like you're floating along in a sort of haze with two dimensional feeling to it or something. If it's not grounded in a place or history or, I mean, we all live on the world, in the world, on the world. We're, you know, we all have, I'm sitting in my setting, you're sitting in your setting right now. And it's it's pretty damn real, right? And it's, it's, uh, and we're writing stories, but they have to feel real. That have to feel real. Absolutely. And especially if you're going to tackle something like the jungle or Greenland or the Arctic, where people are going to be paying attention because a lot of times they probably haven't been there. I mean, that's part of the story is the setting. And so you you want to feel like you've been taken there, transported there. And I would think it'd be much simpler to write about a place like that if you'd been there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, there weren't a lot of surprises when I went there, except that I I looked at the pictures, you know, and I thought, okay. Giant icebergs, nobody around. I mean, this 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 uh, place is the largest island in the world. It's a third the size of Canada per land mass, and only fifty six thousand people live there. Think about that. I mean, I live in Framingham. We have seventy seven thousand people in Framingham alone, and fifty six thousand people are spread out over, you know, six hundred sixty thousand square miles, and you know. The ice cap is 1,500 miles north to south, 700 miles east to west, second biggest to Antarctica, and it's two miles deep at its thickest and surrounded by mountains just shutting up out of the, out of the, um, out of the sea. And if Greenland were to ever melt, the seas would rise by 23 feet, which is so terrifying. What's also weird is the land mass of Greenland would be so much lighter, it would actually rise up. So that's totally weird. That is weird. But when I went there, I I was I wasn't prepared for the scale of things even though I saw the pictures. The pictures are two-dimensional though, right? I mean, go there and it's like, I mean, it's just jaw-dropping. And the, the we went kayaking um amongst these monstrous icebergs. They were city blocks long. They were 10 stories high. They were carved into these bizarre shapes by wind and, and, and ice and sea. And, you know, this one was like a city block long. It just looked like the ca- a caterpillar. I can't explain it. The way it was carved. Others just look like monstrous cathedrals or just bizarre, bizarre, bizarre shapes. And we were always hearing explosions in the distance, you know, muffled or like gunshots. And we knew that those were calving events or just maybe an iceberg, sometimes they flip over. It's the most, you know, with no warning, this massive house-sized iceberg will turn in the water. Anyway, so we were kayaking this place called the Iceberg Graveyard. It's so-called because for whatever reason, ocean currents would wash in these monsters, these monstrous icebergs. And we were kayaking and I I asked my guide, I said, well, what would happen if one of these, you know, broke? (laughs) He said, well, just be quiet, be listening, because if you hear it, then you need to turn your kayak, the nose of your kayak toward the sound. Otherwise, a wave will come and probably you know, flip you into, you know, 30 degree water that's half a mile deep. 
You're like, that's not scary. <laughs> and he said, he, he, he didn't say you're going to live. He just said, turn your kayak toward the sound. So uh, we just kind of looked at each other. I was there with about six other people from around the world. And what do you do, though? Would go home? I'm like, okay, this is fun. But that's, <laughs> like, I guess, what I mean, because you can look at photos of that stuff all day long. But there's nothing like being right there and kayaking next to an iceberg that is the size of a huge building and a city or two city block long. You know, you just can't really imagine that till you see it, I don't think. Yeah. And then you notice, you know, I'm sure you've read or heard or seen that, that most of these icebergs are, are under the water and they're also bizarrely shaped. And the colors are just out of this world. I mean, the greens and the blues and it's if it's sunset, the purples, and also sort of the, you know, the element of danger. There are polar bears, you know, we carried guns and, and um, our guides carried guns anyway. And we slept in the, these sort of canvas, like cabin slash cabin tent situations with this kind of wimpy looking electric fence around us. You know, it was... Uh, it was uh, incredibly fun. I bet so. It sounds like so much fun. Yeah. So tell me, Erica, what was the hardest part of writing this book? Oh, God. All of it. <laughs> oh, God. Writing is so hard. Um, and you keep thinking, oh, it'll be easier in the next book. No, it's not. Uh, the hardest part of this one was just getting everything right. Just getting all the storylines to work together, you know, trying not to telegraph the ending, just wanting the ending to make sense once you got there and feel, you know, the ending should feel inevitable yet surprising, right? That's the ideal ending. That's, that's what we're, like, we're all shooting for. And I just wanted to try to achieve that. And, um, you know, that's always a challenge. You know, beginnings and endings are always a challenge for me. And also the middle's hard. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty yeah. much all of it. <laughs> you know, the whole thing is really hard, you know. And, and you're working, and I mean, I work, I don't show chapters to people. So it's the, it's the isolation, I think. I mean, I was, it was COVID, right? So I had that layer of isolation. And it, it was, it was rough. It was rough at times. Because normally, as a writer, you know, we get, we, we balance, we make a balance. We do the, the isolation alone. And then you're able to mix it up with things, visits with people or whatever it is, you know, being outside. And, and it was hard to achieve that balance during that time, as we all know damn well, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, one of the questions I did have for you was whether it got easier as you kept writing. So it sounds like maybe it really doesn't, that you're kind of starting over each time. Every book is like climbing Everest in business casual. <laughs> That's a picture. You know, I, but what I do make it the way I, I guess I make a quote easier for myself is my, I think my method really helps me like really landing an idea on an idea. I love taking my time writing the outline. Now, let, let me say, I mean, the outline for this book was a hundred pages long, but I still allow myself surprises. You know, I still allow myself. I don't, I'm not so trapped in that outline that there's not creativity in there, obviously, but it's an enormous task to write a book. It's it, to write it to write one to write a good one to write one that you're proud of to write one that other people enjoy and and I see and it is my job to I feel like my job is to create a piece of entertainment. Not everyone's gonna love it, that's for sure. But to know that I've done the best I can with the with with the um, the talent that I have and the, the time that I have, you know. So. But yeah, I, I don't I don't really think that I mean, for me it hasn't gotten easier. I've had friends say to me, Oh God, you know, I, I wrote this book and it just fell out of me and it was kind of miraculous and I wrote ten pages a day till it was done and I was like, Why doesn't that ever happen to me? I've never have exp have you experienced anything like that? Well, I don't write. I mean, I write book reviews and I write okay. roundups, but I'm not writing my own writing. So, okay. but I can't imagine that happening to me. I can't imagine writing fiction. So, yeah, maybe people get possessed by something that I've never been possessed by. Well, what about characters? Which was the favorite to write and which was the hardest to write? 
I really liked writing Jean. I mean, she's she Jean is uh, as you know, she was she's sort of the grunt who works with Wyatt, who is the main researcher up there, uh, the main climate science research researcher. And I don't know, she's this older woman, and she's this combination of kind of love struck by Wyatt, but also just filled with grief because she, her she lost her her husband and daughter in a car crash. And so she's trying to deal with that and she's trying to figure out where she stands with the addition of Val being there and the other researchers. And she's just, a, she's I, for me, she was a complicated, fun character to write. I thought it was difficult writing Sigrid because I was trying to imagine someone from such a different culture that, and in the beginning, she doesn't speak. So... I had to make her communicate with her actions. And then, as you know, she started drawing and what was she drawing and why? And so I had to make her communicate that way. So I found that really challenging. But then I started to really enjoy it. So it's funny. you reach. I think you reach a certain point when you're pushing through a difficult situation. You come out on the other side and you say, wow, I, I, I get it now. What It just gets easier for some reason. I mean, sometimes you just go to bed or I just go to bed thinking, I'm never going to figure this out. I'm just never going to figure this out. And then the next day or week I do, I guess that, I guess life is like that. It's like, you know, it's like the thing you're worried about today, Monday, whatever day it is, March 28th, you know, I could ask you next Monday what it was. You'll be like, I don't know. I'm on to my next uh, problem, right? I also think if I put something aside and try not to think about it, that usually in the background, my brain is kind of puzzling it out. So then a couple days later, it will come to me and I'll be like, oh, why didn't I think of that? Yes. I mean, we we do not give our subconscious the the credit to, I mean, but it is just very frustrating when you want the answer and you're, you know, what I do, I just work and work and work until I'm really, you know, super overtired. And then I just got to trust a little more that I, that I will find out the answer. I just get very, I just get very, you know, I want the answer. <laughs> very single-minded. You want to get a very single-minded. that done yeah. and move on. And I'm the same way, yeah. but I have just realized, okay, I've got to sort of let this go right now or I'm going to drive myself crazy. It's even like when you can't recall the name of something, like I'm like, what's the name of that band or what's the name of that song? Yeah. And the harder I try, the worse it is. So then if I put it away, like an hour later, I'm like, oh, I know, you know, so it's just kind of letting your brain sit with it for a little bit, but it's hard to do that. It's hard to do that, but yeah, exactly. Like put the thing aside and actually work on something else. That's really easy. Like go cook dinner for crying out loud, right? Exactly. Well, what do you hope your readers take away from the book? I I want to take them, I hope this takes them on just a wild, wild ride for number one. Number two, uh, I want to, I mean, Greenland is just one of the few places on earth where there's a sense of mystery left you know it's not a place that's been ruined yet so i think it feels i think the human mind needs that sense of mystery and sense of wonder about the world because we have a you know simultaneous impulse to solve a mystery yet we need mystery we don't know everything we i mean for example i think that the science of trees and biology and learning how trees communicate is in its infancy. We know that the mother tree or an older tree, when it's dying, will release its sugars to its saplings, not just its saplings, but young trees. And just to know that alone is is so stunning. What else is it communicating? I mean, there in Africa, there are these acacia trees and giraffes will eat the leaves, you know, from the acacia trees, but the acacia trees tree will release a kind of uh, unpleasant tasting toxic thing in its leaf and the, the giraffe will, will stop eating it. But not only that, it releases something in the air that the, or through the root system, I'm not sure which, to neighboring acacia trees. To neighboring acacia trees will release this noxious tasting chemical in their leaves, you know, saving itself from being eaten. I guess that's an example of how did I get on that? Just what a mystery. What a mystery. And I feel like there's something healthy about not knowing everything quite yet. 
Absolutely. And I think it's so interesting to read about things like that, things that I don't know myself and I learn, even though it's a fictional book right? or, you know, a topic that's fictional, I still learn all sorts of cool things like that. Yeah. And people have said reading Girl and Ice, they they do learn a little bit of history and, and a lot about Greenland and a little bit about climate science. But again, a lot of things in the book are, are just on the edge of what's real and what's not so you know, people have asked, asked, well, there is a phenomenon in the book, as you know, called ice winds. And these winds, the, the generation of the idea was from a real phenomenon called a pitarac, you know, and a pitarac is a kind of wind that shoots down off the glacier very, very fast. And it's super, super cold. And we don't feel that because we don't live on glaciers, right? But they exist. But in my story, they, they come down and these different areas and they and they freeze people instantly so that's that's the push into well could that be true maybe maybe not so i think that's fun yeah to kind of take it a little bit farther yeah exactly well before we wrap up i would love to hear what you have read recently that you really liked i have read and i and i'm i'm late to the party on a bunch of these but the push by ashley i'm sorry not ashley audrey audrain is a fabulous reimagining of sort of the bad seed, you know, the child that is not so nice that you've given birth to and you have to deal with. I loved that book. The Need by Helen Phillips. Uh, Again, this is probably a year old, but it's kind of, again, you know, coasts the line between what could be and what and what couldn't be. The North Water by Ian McGuire was a fabulous book that was made into a movie. It takes place. It's kind of like the real story of sort of the real Moby Dick, uh, but in a very visceral way. Fantastic story. And let's see one more, a not well-known one called Into the Distance by Hernan Diaz, H-E-R-N-A-N Diaz, D-I-A-Z. Impossible to explain. Just just pick it up and give it a read. I think he has a new book coming out this spring. He does. He does. I, did. I think he does. Is it out yet? No, I think it comes out. I think it comes out in April or May. The only reason I know is because he was on a list of authors that Penguin Random House sent to me to see if I wanted to interview them. And that, that's a different name. And so I, it stuck out to me. Okay, well, that's good to know. I wasn't familiar with him. So interesting. What else? Bath, I mean, I just read Bathhouse by PJ Vernon. Right. I remember when that was first out, people were posting all over Instagram about it. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Uh, yeah, it's a wild cover, too. It's a wild cover. And I'm just reading old, I just, for whatever reason, reading old favorites. So, uh, Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes. Have you ever read that? I have. It's so oh, good, but so, so sad. So I haven't read it in a sad. while. One of my kids had to read it for school and it was a while ago and I reread it, but oh, it's just so sad. It makes me very sad. Yeah, so it is it is sad, but what a story. Oh yes. my God. Yes. Anyway, that's pretty much it. Well good. Well that's a great list. And now I know I need to go look up Hernan Diaz because I remembered that name. Well Erica, thank you so much for coming on the Thoughts from a Page podcast and talking about Girl and Ice. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate it. Thank you. I'm Anne-Marie Kelly. Wild Precious Life is a podcast about dreaming big, digging in and connecting across distance, division, and loss. In each episode, I talk with prize-winning writers, musicians, and wanderers who remind all of us how we can make the most of the time we have. So meet me here. Let's walk and talk and dream and discover what it means to be wild, precious, and brave. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts From a Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. Tell all of your friends about the show and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. I'm 
I'm Anne-Marie Kelly. Wild Precious Life is a podcast about dreaming big, digging in and connecting across distance, division, and loss. In each episode, I talk with prize-winning writers, musicians, and wanderers who remind all of us how we can make the most of the time we have. So meet me here. Let's walk and talk and dream and discover what it means to be wild, precious, and brave. 